Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. So today we have uh, uh, the honor and the pleasure to have uh, Simona Bellippi from uh, uh, the University of Milano Bicocca, or we like to call it the University of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> uh, you will understand the joke maybe later. <laughs> uh, so Simona is uh, quite famous mainly on the work that she did on defects in silicon. So I assume that everyone that work on defects in silicon, micro PL measurement, quite aware for the work that she and her group did for many years. But she also uh, quite active in the area of CZTS and SINFIN. And she's visiting us for two weeks as part of the UNSW program of Women in Engineering. Uh, so she will have one talk today and another talk tomorrow. So today is more on the CZTS one, tomorrow it will be more on the silicon one. Uh, Simona is an uh, associate professor or how it's called? Uh, full accounted professor, so <laughs> it's a bit different terms in uh, Italy. Uh, but she's quite amazing. So she did a p uh, undergrad in physics, then did master in material science, PhD in chemistry, and probably the next one will be medical <laughs> study or no. something like that. Not so she's absolutely not. <laughs> she knows everything about everything. Uh, or nothing <laughs> about nothing. <laughs> How will you argue about everything about everything? So it's really amazing uh, to have someone with this wide uh, range of knowledge uh, visit us. So Simona, okay. we are looking forward <laughs> to you. Thank you very much for visiting us. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Ziva, for this very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm, it's a really a privilege for me to be here in a so amazing town and country, and uh, above all, in one of the most uh, important research centers in the world for photovoltaic energy. Uh, today I am speaking about uh, the work that uh, we are carrying out in the frame of uh, calcogenide in film solar cell. Uh, but uh, before, I will just uh, give you some uh, uh, information about uh, my university, University of Milano Bicocca. It's a young uh, and public university, it was established in 1998. Uh, we, uh, we have, uh, it's a multidisciplinary university. Uh, we have more than uh, 14 departments. We are organized in department instead of school, in uh, economy, statistics, law, education, sociology, sociology, medicine, psychology, and science, and that means uh, physical, chemistry, material science, biology, biotechnology. Uh, we have about uh, uh, 37,000 students, and uh, we have also some uh, international students, just uh, about 10% of our students are international students, because we have only uh, 12 uh, uh, master degrees uh, uh, taught in English. But we have also uh, seven, more than 17 total degree courses and one uh, uh, doctoral school with more than 19 uh, PhD courses. We are young, but uh, we achieved some important uh, achievement in the last uh, 20 years. We are the third uh, university in Lombardy, that is a big region in the north of Italy, close to around Milano. Uh, we have second in the national classification, in the national classification uh, in, uh, in, our, in the ranking of Italy, uh, based on the research activities and on the research um, activities uh, carried out. Uh, and the result carried out in this frame. Then, in from an international point of view, we are just uh, the number 82 among universities younger than 50 years old. We are a un campus university. It, it, it's uh, quite uh, strange in Italy. So it's, uh, it's downtown, but it's a campus structure with more than 28 buildings. And we have also a campus in Maldives to study, of course, uh, environmental science, uh, marine biology, science of tourism, and human geography that we cannot study in, in Milano. My work, my research activity is carried out in the Department of Material Science. The Department of Material Science was one of the, uh, the eight departments in our university that was defined as an excellence by our uh, ministry, and so we receive an extra money for research activities in the frame of uh, materials for sustainable energy in the next year. Inside the Department of Material Science, we have the bachelor and the master degrees in material science, in chemistry and optical technologies. By the way, I have the dean of chemistry courses, and also we have a PhD in material science. Inside the Department of Material Science, uh, we have established in 2010 a MIB Solar Center, that is a center 
a small center in comparison with this one, of course. But uh, the idea was uh, uh, to, um, to organize and uh, to make more synergic the previous research activities uh, in the frame of solar energy inside the Department of Material Science. So, uh, and our, our mission was uh, to create a center that was able to pass from uh, an academic research to the setup of prototype devices for, uh, for, uh, for in industrial cooperation. Uh, so, it's m maybe it's quite common for you, but in Italy it's not so common to have a center that is able to, uh, to support small and medium enterprise uh, to carry out uh, research activities uh, in the frame of photovoltaic energy. And so this was how our mission. Now we have established a good uh, network uh, in, in Italy, in Europe, uh, with other research centers. In, in Europe uh, we are a full member of European Energy Research Alliance, uh, that is an association with more than 150 research centers working in low carbon energy. And uh, now we have, of course, uh, more or less all the techniques that we need for material characterization, mainly spectroscopic characterization, electrical X-ray diffraction and all measurement. And also we can uh, prepare material and also cell in the frame of calcogenide, organic, disensitized solar cell, perovskite, and also we can characterize and make uh, our devices by the standard techniques. Uh, the main research topics are inorganic photovoltaic devices, uh, so silicon, inorganic thin film, calcogenide base, uh, and also a colleague of mine are responsible of the organic photovoltaic uh, mm, devices, uh, mainly disensitized solar cell, perovskite, and organic solar cell. And also they are working now on the production of hydrogen by artificial photosynthesis process. And we are working also on uh, the purification of biogas, removing carbon dioxide. So, for as, as far as concern in organic photovoltaic materials and devices, I am responsible of these uh, research topics. Um, as uh, Ziva told, I've been working for many years, more than 25, on uh, silicon, mainly for the characterization. So I'm been, I've been involved in many European projects on multicrystalline silicon and monocrystalline silicon. And our role was uh, mainly related to the characterization, to study how the defect can affect the electrical and the efficiency properties of the solar cell. But we are working also on light harvesting and also metallurgy grey silicon. Now we'll discuss much more in detail uh, the inorganic thin film technologies uh, related to calcogenide, but uh, we are also working on the characterization of 3-5 multijunction solar devices. Uh, we are, this is work that we are, car we are carrying out in, in collaboration with a company that is Chesi. Chesi is a quite famous company. Uh, they produce, uh, um, it produce uh, uh, multi-junction solar, solar devices based on 3.5 for space application with efficiencies higher than 34%. Uh, and how our collaboration with them is related to the characterization mainly by spectral response and by photoluminescence to study the effect of radio damage during the operation work. So, uh, we're starting with describing much more in details how our activities in calcogenide thin film solar cell, and we're starting uh, from a, a historical point of view from our side that we started in 2010 uh, to work on CIGS. CIGS, uh, you are very, of course, we are very familiar with the property of CIGS. It's, uh, it's a well-established well technology so with efficiencies quite close to that of silicon on small area, 22.9%, 20, but less, uh, the, the efficiencies in the modules is much uh, lesser, 16.5%. Also, the total worldwide uh, CGS production is very low, this is around a 2 gigawatt peak. But in any case, CIGS has very interesting properties because uh, you can create uh, some modules that are different in comparison with that of silicon and are much more suitable for flexible and uh, for building and product integration of photovoltaic. And also CIGS can be used as a bottom uh, cell in a tandem devices because it has a, a good um, a perfect band gap in the around 1.1 uh, EV, but can be uh, tuned according to the gallium concentration. And also it has some other important properties uh, in comparison with silicon, like uh, good low light performance, uh, lower temperature coefficient, and, and also a shorter energy payback time. 
Of course, uh, when, when we started, and also now, there, are, uh, there were some open questions related to CIGS. Mainly, I relate to the fact that it's a quite complex alloy. Uh, it's a quaternary alloy so with a lot of defects, secondary phases inside. And so it's the, the knowledge and the f of the physical properties of this material is not so high, like in the case of silicon. And this is, could be important in order to uh, increase and to improve the efficiencies of uh, this uh, solar cell and of the, uh, its modules. Also, the current production should increase. And uh, so the idea is, uh, is uh, to, mm, in order to increase the, caro pro the current production of CIGS solar cell, it's important also to uh, develop a new system that are able uh, uh, to, uh, um, to reduce the cost uh, and, then are, and are, as, uh, are also su suitable for a, scale, um, a, a road to roll configuration for a flexible substrate. And so we're starting uh, working on this topic in collaboration with a company. As really was a really small company, the Volta Solar is a company uh, in, um, in, in Italy. And uh, they wanted to develop with us a new deposition system for CIGS. And the idea was to develop a new system that was a hybrid between a sputtering and evaporation system, because we wanted uh, to get the highest efficiencies that are normally Get, mm, get by evaporation system, but also to have a system that is much more suitable for uh, industrial application, like, a spattering, th like the spattering one. So uh, very briefly how this uh, system works, uh, we have uh, um, two different uh, uh, parts in our instrument. One is in our equipment, one is the sputtering zone and the other is the evaporation zone. In the sputtering zone, the metal precursors are sputtered not directly on the substrate, but on an ad hoc devices that we call transfer devices that is rotating one. Then, when uh, this uh, uh, device is, is in the front of the substrate, in the, the evaporation zone, there is evaporation of the metals uh, by local heating, local heating system in selenium atmosphere, because the transfer device is made by graphite stripes. Then, the sputtering and evaporation process can go on until the right thickness uh, is reached, and then we have a cooling step always in the presence of selenium. If you don't use a substrate like a soda lime glass, we can introduce a sodium by the evaporation of sodium by sodium fluoride source. And uh, you can see that this can be done uh, in a in a in a roll to roll configuration and we will be see much more clear in the in the in the industrial line that I will show later. Then we developed a system in order to, um, to have a sort of R&D line to check uh, the quality of our machine, checking the quality of our material and our devices, it means the efficiencies. So we have the position time that was in the order of, of half an hour, the position process that can be, can be tuned between uh, uh, 550 degrees C to 450 degrees C when we have a polyamide as a substrate. Then uh, we can, uh, we can uh, have a different type of substrate uh, and in roll to roll configuration of or also standard uh, 20 uh, um, for 120 centimeters. And, uh, and then uh, we, of course, uh, um, um, can, uh, can make uh, the solar devices with the standard configuration in which we use a cadmium sulfide by buff deposition and absorber layer. Uh, this is our best result uh, that we got on different types of substrate, glass, flexible steel, polyamide and flexible thin glass. Now we are uh, mm, optimizing this system, we are mm, changing part of our system in order to deposit by this technique the CGS, in that it's a very high band gap, to perform tandem solar cell. But this is just a new work and I cannot show you anything. Uh, by this technique, uh, what is uh, what it was uh, interesting is that it's, it's possible mm, to uh, perform the classical in-depth profile that is typical of evaporation system that uh, is, uh, is important uh, to, to get uh, high efficiencies uh, uh, in this type of solar cell. And so it's possible to have uh, an in-deep profile of GGI uh, that you can see it's quite, uh, quite close to that of the record efficiencies. And this is it's not, this, it's not, it's not equal and so maybe can it, this can explain the fact that our efficiencies are a little bit lower than the record efficiencies. By uh, considering that uh, this type of, uh, um, 
of uh, GGI profile is a, fun is a, fun is it's a key role to get high efficiencies and in order to check this profile is it necessary to perform a uh, second ion mass spectroscopy that is a quite expensive technique that is not uh, suitable in any uh, lab. For instance in Italy we have just two techniques, uh, two equipments in the north of Italy quite far from Milano. And uh, so we developed uh, a new system based on repeated bromine etching on CIGS in film in order to make a correlation between the profile and the uh, GGI uh, ratio uh, based on uh, Raman spectroscopy, studying uh, the Raman shift versus uh, the GGI concentration, obtaining a good uh, um, agreement uh, with uh, um, uh, secondary, ion secondary ion mass spectroscopy. Then we stopped the activity in CIGS because we succeed in transfer this equipment with the company uh, to another company to have a one megawatt production line. This company is an Austrian company, is a, its name is Sunplugged, and maybe here is much more clear what I mean with a roll-to-roll -roll configuration and what I mean with three-stage process. We have a uh, different target, uh, poor uh, metal target, indium, gallium, uh, copper, and then we have the, the sputtering on the transfer devices and then the evaporation on the flexible substance that is moving uh, under the targets in a roll-to-roll -roll, uh, way. We, we know that, and you know better than me, that in the case of CIGS there are, there are a lot of constraints related to the fact that it's based on indium and gallium that are not abundant elements in the earth crust, and so has uh, many other groups uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, we move uh, to find the new material uh, uh, in order to uh, overcome uh, this, uh, this strong constraint. And, also, and uh, so uh, has uh, as many groups, uh, we're starting uh, working on Kesserite, that, as you know, is, uh, is environmentally friendly, especially the one uh, with sulfur instead of selenium. It has a very interesting band gap, high absorption coefficient, is, as the efficiency record, the one, it's, uh, the one that has been uh, obtaining in this uh, center, it's very promising. We're starting with uh, um, the classical two-step approach, uh, approaches uh, by um, sputtering of the metal precursors by sputtering radio frequencies from uh, three different uh, um, high pure targets of copper, zinc and tin on uh, a classical uh, um, soda lime glasses coated by molybdenum. And then uh, we decided, and then we, uh, we perform sulfurization, but avoiding H2S uh, because it's a toxic gases and we cannot, you cannot use and we don't want to use, and just using uh, sulfur in a sulfur uh, atmosphere by sulfur power. Um, we, we developed the system and uh, we're starting with an efficiency around 40% that it was not so bad but it's quite far from the record of efficiency at that time and also now. So we decided that uh, how are the gap between our record efficiencies and the, the record efficiencies um, get in the other labs was uh, too big to go on, on these techniques for us and so we decided to move to develop a new type of process to um, to deposit uh, um, uh, uh Sorry, I uh, forgot to say that, of course, uh, before deciding to stop uh, this, this activity on, uh, mm, on, uh, on a sputtering system, uh, we have we did a lot of characterization of now, on our material to understand which type of degrad were responsible of the efficiencies close to 4%. For instance, we perform Raman and X-ray diffraction and photoluminescence, and we see that uh, we, ha we had a lot of uh, secondary phases, mainly the deleterious one, GTS, and also it's impo uh, important to under, um, it's important to underline that we cannot perform any KCN um, treatment, etching treatment, before making our soil cell because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, allowed this uh, acid in our, in our system. Uh, we performed also a lot of photoluminescence on this material and we have seen that uh, there is a lot of defect, as, as you know, in this material and also we, uh, we have in our material a, a quite high uh, mm, 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 defect band around 0 0.8 e, 0 0.80 V that is much more probably related to uh, mm, uh, secondary phases in our material. So we decided to move uh, forward to changing the deposition process and our idea was to develop a completely uh, uh, no toxic, simple and cheap process based on the soil gel techniques. 
So our idea was uh, to, uh, uh, to prepare uh, a molecular ink uh, starting from acetate and uh, of copper and zinc and uh, tin chloride. And then, after completed the solution of these precursors, we added the urea. Urea was a how, is a our source of sulfur because we wanted to introduce in another way sulfur, so just putting him, put, putting it in the solution. Then we studied, of course, investigating the composition and the stability of our uh, molecular ink before depositing uh, uh, heat on a substrate. And uh, we have seen uh, that, of course, there was a changing in, viscosi in viscosity according to the time. And also, there is uh, um, uh, this viscosity, the, the sol gel viscosity increase uh, due to polycondensation process until the ink involves the gel. And we follow this uh, evolution by Raman, and we have seen uh, that uh, after the, um, the at the beginning, we have just the signal related to the methyl sulfoxide, then this, this signal disappears, and uh, there is uh, this, the, 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 the signal related to urea is much more visible, and there are also, uh, there are also some signals that indicate that the urea is uh, coordinated by the metals. And this, it's very important to form to the, for, to the further formation of castorite thin film solar cell. Because then, after the optimization of the molecular hinkel, we've just uh, prepared our film in a very simple way by a direct drop casting method on the substrate, of course, a substrate coated by molybdeno, for instance, or FTO uh, glass uh, substrate. And uh, then, uh, in after two uh, steps uh, process, uh, in annealing in argon, just in argon, without the sulfur, at 550 degrees C, to, to get uh, a final thickness of around 1.2, 1.5 micrometers. So it's really a very simple uh, method. Uh, we optimize, of course, the solution, uh, the composition, the ratio between uh, uh, the, uh, the components in the solution in order to get uh, the best uh, composition in the film in terms of copper, uh, copper poor and zinc rich uh, ratio. And we have grains uh, in the order of uh, um, 200, uh, 300 nanometers. Uh, about the, mm, the, for the properties of this film, film, we have a quite good Raman spectra with all the signals related to castorite and without uh, any uh, secondary phases. And also the X-ray diffraction spe spectrometer are very, very good. Uh, we checked also by XPS analysis uh, uh, the, the composition and we have seen uh, that uh, the copper, zinc, tin and, and sulfur are in the proper oxidation states for uh, uh, castorite tin film. As far as concerned the optical properties, the band gap uh, by Tauk plot is has expected around 1.4 eV and also by photoluminescence uh, we have a quite uh, uh, feeble signal at room temperature but a quite good signal at low temperature with a quasi donor receptor pair and we didn't see any um, defect band around 0.8. Here we, uh, we get, uh, here I reported how our best uh, device performance. Uh, it's clear, it's very far from, uh, uh, for, from for your record, of course. It's in the order of 1.1%. But uh, if you can see, there is a very uh, respectable uh, short circuit current and uh, a modest open circuit voltage. Uh, we perform some very simple SCAPS uh, software simulation that uh, they show that there are some problems at the interface, uh, mainly with the back contact. So by this method, uh, we can very easily deposit the uh, created thin film just by a, a, a drop casting with a gelation process or we can control the viscosity and we can use uh, this uh, molecular ink for spin coating deposition or uh, our idea is uh, to optimize the viscosity in order to use uh, this uh, precursor ink uh, for a inkjet uh, printer uh, deposition system. Then, by this method, uh, it's possible uh, to incorporate uh, different type of uh, metals or, uh, or, or, or other elements in order to, in to tune the gap, for instance. So we started introducing incorporating iron, and it was very simple because we have just uh, to add uh, acetate, iron acetate in the molecular ink, and then to perform the same process that I have described before. 
And uh, we have seen that there was a changing the band gap and also the quality of the tin film result very promising. There is a changing in the cassurite to stenit structure according to the iron concentration and also the band gap can be changed between 1.2 to 1.6. So this uh, method, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite new for us, uh, but it's very promising according to our opinion because it's very cheap, uh, simple and uh, can be adapted uh, to a different type of deposition. Of course, uh, we have uh, to work a lot in order to increase the efficiencies of uh, our uh, uh, devices. Uh, we have a problem with back contact. For instance, we have seen that we have a quite thick uh, molybdenum sulfide on the back uh, during that it's, uh, it's formed uh, during the annealing uh, thanks to the theorea. So we have to check again the theorea concentration and also the annealing because at the moment uh, we are performing standard annealing steps, uh, not uh, RTA uh, rapid terminal annealing. We don't use any etching with KCN, so we have maybe some problem at the surface. And also we have uh, two uh, studying and we are, we are in our, our layer ma mainly deposited by atomic alloy, uh, uh, ALD deposition system. Uh, on Kesterite, we are working in collaboration also with another group that is Polytechnic of Milan, it's another university, quite important, it's an engineering one, and uh, they are in charge of electro deposition system, so they are, uh, they are electrochemistry uh, researcher, and uh, so they are studying uh, how to use electro deposition for, the, for uh, making uh, Kesterite solar cell, because electro deposition is one of the most attractive fabrication routes because uh, uh, it can use on a large area and it's also really low cost process and easily scalable. Uh, at the moment the quality of the kesturite that we checked by Raman photoluminescence it's uh, lower than the one that uh, we have uh, with a wet process and with uh, um, um, sputtering plus annealing, but uh, at, mm, using the stack element layers approach, uh, it's, it's really a, a very um, interesting approach to create, to, to, to make kesterite films, uh, because it's steps, so you can control the stoichiometry quite, quite well, changing the thickness of the single layers and uh, also the uh, taking orders. Uh, they are working on different type of solution. This is one that has been recently published uh, that is a non-aqueous plate, non plating solution. Uh, we checked also the possibility of uh, performing a GZTSE by electrodeposition and uh, we, this is our first attempt, uh, we, get an, uh, we, get a, we, we, we got a devices with 0.1 efficiencies but the quality of the is, uh, is, is not so bad and the advantage of this uh, technique is that uh, like in this case uh, you can use uh, the molybdenum as uh, a subset but also as a subset for the electrodeposition process so as uh, one of the, um, the, um, the, the anodes or cathodes and also as a back contact so you can have uh, directly a uh, castorite tin film on flexible uh, molybdenum subset of course, the quality of the, the, of the CIGS uh, is not uh, so high due to the fact that the surface of the molybdenum used for electrochemical deposition is not the best one, but we are working on. Then uh, we decided also to investigate uh, an alternative to Kesterite that is uh, copper manganese tin sulfide. The idea is uh, to use, uh, uh, to replace uh, um, zinc with manganese because manganese is, uh, uh, is uh, um, have an abundance in the earth crust that is two, uh, two order of magnitude higher than that of zinc and so it's uh, cheaper. And uh, so it's in, in principle you can get a um, 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 solar cell low with lower uh, watt peak cost. At the moment, this material has been studied only for uh, uh, its uh, magnetic properties uh, for uh, spin, uh, spintronic application, and there is uh, just one group in the world that is a group uh, in, uh, in the Professor Chen in the University of Shanghai that is working on this material for PV application by. At this time, we start also in this case we start uh, uh, a vacuum approach not by sputtering by, uh, by but uh, uh, the metal were evaporated by a beam uh, evaporating system 
for the bionanilling in, uh, in, uh, in elemental sulfur vapor, standard annealing. So we studied the how to, to change the, 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 the sequence of the metals uh, deposition by e-beam and uh, then we, mm, at the end the same which stack structure was the best one. Then we studied, of course, uh, which type of temperature is the best one in between 500 degrees C to 585 degrees C for about one hour. Uh, then we, we, we found that it was very, very important to have a pre-annealing uh, at lower temperature around 100 degrees C in order to enhance uh, metal intermixing. Uh, before uh, the formation of the phases and we use uh, the standard the beginning we use the standard soda lime glasses uh, coated uh, with uh, molybdenum deposited by sputtering. Uh, we checked uh, the quality of our material. We have seen that according to ADX and Raman analysis uh, we have the CMTS phases. Uh, of course we have some secondary phases uh, mainly man manganese sulfide that can be detected also by uh, Raman spectroscopy and uh, according to X-ray diffraction analysis, uh, we have a stannic structure instead of the castorite one as expected. And uh, this has been uh, proved also performing uh, uh, X-ray uh, diffraction um, analysis in, uh, in the, in the, uh, the B-Lime at SRSFR synchrotron uh, facility uh, in Grenoble. And uh, we have seen that there is also sulfide compound inside that has uh, a spinel structure. Uh, the band gap is uh, the band gap is uh, the, the right one is in the order of 1.2 eV and also uh, this material has a very high absorption coefficient so it's, uh, it's suitable for PV application for this point of view. Um, mm, it's uh, our first uh, devices uh, has an efficiency uh, of the, on the around 0 0.5 so the best one of course so we performed several uh, um, PV devices. Uh, also in this case uh, like in the case of Kessura at the beginning uh, we, we found a lot of deeper recombination center detected by PL at a lower energy and may be related to the presence of secondary phases that was detec detected by Raman and by X-ray D. And we try to increase our efficiencies with the standard annealing step that is normally performed also in castorite. Of course, we have to optimize the temperature, so we check the several temperatures and annealing at uh, 225 degrees C, we will have an improvement of all device parameters and we have an efficiency of 0.83%. It's very low, I know, but it's uh, really it's uh, the record efficiencies at the moment because the other group that is working on this material uh, uh, got an efficiency around zero point. Addition of increase of efficiencies with this that there is a decrease of the uh, defects band by photoluminescence, but uh, we have also to uh, pay attention to the fact that during the annealing there was in our sample some degradation of the cadmium sulfide layer that can induce, uh, that can be detected by photoluminescence in visible range. And so we, 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 we found a band at 2.4 EV that is related to an improvement of uh, uh, cadmium sulfide crystalline phases uh, inside the cadmium sulfide film uh, that is uh, um, responsible of reducing the band gap and so of reducing the uh, in, in inducing uh, reducing of the absorption of the light in our devices. So uh, we have uh, just uh, a summary of uh, how our uh, main result related to calcogenide, the, the recent one. Uh, we have developed uh, a new uh, system for, uh, for depositing um, high quality castorite tin film. It's uh, really a very uh, cheap and uh, low cost and simple. Uh, we are testing a new material for a PV absorber, CMTS, and also it's very, it's, it's, it seems very promising also using electro deposition and electrochemical approach to deposit castorite. Of course, uh, we have a lot of work to do in order to increase our efficiencies uh, to improve the, pro the properties of our, of our materials. 
uh, we have to reduce harmful defect. Uh, we have to test uh, because we, we want to move from candium sulfide to much more uh, suitable for environment, environmental friendly material. So we want to test uh, alternative buffer layers. Uh, we will receive a new atomic layer deposition next year. So maybe we will use uh, to perform atomic uh, um, to testing alternative buffer layer, but also to introduce uh, some intermediate layers in order to improve the interface um, pro um, properties uh, um, uh, in, uh, in t between our film and uh, the, the, the buffer layer. And uh, so the idea is also to use uh, the wet process for CMTS so up to CFTS and also to introduce a germanium in our layers. And because our final aim is to use a completely low cost solution process to get the full inorganic air abundant multi-junction solar cell. So thank you very much for your kind attention. So my name is Chang from CDTS Group in USW. So uh, I just wonder why you use the fibers to make the ink to alloy the CDTS. Because uh, when you incorporate the fibrous iron, they will introduce some high, high level defects. Yep. Maybe have you tried adding other elements like? Yes, yes. We, uh, the idea was uh, to check the, the possibility of um, tuning the gap. So introducing iron, there are some uh, very interesting uh, literature uh, articles related to, to the change of the gap uh, and uh, there are some uh, controversial because uh, according to some uh, uh, theoretical works uh, there is an increase of the gap and according to other works there is a decrease of the gap with the increasing of iron concentration. So the idea is to try to have some uh, different material with an iron, a different band gap in comparison with castorite. But of course, uh, we know that uh, iron is not the best one uh, element uh, because it can introduce uh, some, uh, can, can, be can be diffused also in the bottom layer and so on. So this was our first attempt and what we wanted to check if our method is very, um, is very suitable for changing very easily the composition and so we're starting with uh, iron acetate. But uh, we are working also on germanium that is much more interested and um, and the idea is to use the same process also for CMTS. So starting with acetate, because what we have seen is that uh, acetate, uh, it's uh, very fundamental in order to get high quality tin film, much more than, than um, uh, chloride. Hello, oh, Gina. Hey. Uh, actually, I noticed you start work on the high band gap CAGS, so copper, gallium, sulfide. You just started that work. So I have a question because currently there are two available high band gap CAGS. So one is copper gallium sulfide, another one is copper indium gallium sulfide. No, copper gallium selenide, another one is copper indium gallium sulfide. Mm, do you want to, like, just like a, any reason why you choose a copper gallium selenide instead of copper indium gallium sulfide? Mm, yes, the, there is uh, some uh, very, um, there is a, um, a reason that is related to the fact that we are, uh, we are in, a, in a national project in which there are different groups that are, are testing different material. And uh, at the moment uh, we were the only one that we can use, we can test the uh, CGS because we have the system with a gallium target. So, but the idea, you of course you are right, uh, there is uh, several, uh, we are testing in different groups of different material because the CGS has a quite higher band gap. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is then uh, starting with this material and then eventually after uh, one year of the project in, we, in which we can compare different techniques, mm -hmm. we can choose which, the, which is the best technique and then uh, we, and the best material and then go on with just one type of high band gap. Uh, uh, calcogenide material, so maybe. Yeah. Because so far there are like, a, uh, I think for the efficiency of copper indium gallium sulfide, the efficiency highest one is by solar frontier around 16 to 17 percent. Mm -hmm. The copper gallium selenide efficiency is uh, hung around 12, 12 to 13 percent. Yeah, so yeah, so I just saw like a easier, like maybe uh, there are some like a defects related issue or like a band grading related issue 
of the different performance of these two type of hybrid. I hope to give you an answer next time. <laughs> 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 At the moment, I haven't. Ju we are just started. Mm. Thank you. Other questions? And we look on Ivan because maybe Ivan has a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit unrelated, but it's always been interested. I, I'm, I'm always been interested in finding out if anybody knows. How is it that a PV, any material, uh, deposited on a flexible substrate, keeps on working? When you try to simulate what happens when you stretch it, it seems to be that it shouldn't work. However, it does. So, have you looked at it? In uh, not on this type of material, but uh, I'm working uh, with uh, mm, in flame or, or in, 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 in silicon. Uh, you can you can get a flexible uh, thin film solar cell on silicon and also modules. Uh, mm, we have submitted the European project related to the lit off silicon after uh, mm, porous silicon on uh, parental wafers and uh, um, preliminary the result uh, um, done by important group like CINS and uh, IMEC, they succeed in, uh, in, uh, in making uh, completely flexible uh, also at a certain extent of course we cannot uh, roll it uh, that, are, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are working. So, I think that uh, the same technology, especially in modules, can be also transferred to thin, uh, to a calcogenoid uh, solar cell in the future, uh, at a certain extent of uh, curve. So of course you cannot uh, completely curve uh, your uh, solar cell, but it, it's not necessary. Sometimes it's just necessary just to have uh, uh, partial uh, flexibility of your solar cell. It's just much more than. Uh, the rigid uh, modules that you have that you have now. Yeah, uh, th my question was more towards the physics as to why it does. If, if you look at how much you you stretch the material mm -hmm. when you are bending it, even if it's a relatively <coughs> low radius, um, the properties of the material should be changing. Either you're 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 changing the the um, uh, crystallogra crystallography of it or. Or how is it that I, I, I Yes, you can have some changing. Um, from a physical point of view, you are right. Of course, in the case of uh, um, organic material, polymeric material, of course, you have a big changing in properties. In the case of kesterite and CIGS, maybe you can have uh, some strain, some changing in Raman spectroscopy, in X-ray. But I think that uh, they don't affect so much the electrical properties. Okay, so let's take uh, thanks Simona again, and like I mentioned, tomorrow uh, we have another talk. So thank you so much. Thank you.